this deck, the deck that I'm writing about, uh, was created by Alistair Crowley. And, you know, I'm going to be totally honest with you guys. And you don't have to have, this is my opinion. This is just my opinion. The guy was kind of an asshole, you know, depending on where you find him in his life, depending on where you, where, what you're reading from him and his, in his bio. I think he was a lot of different people at different times, but he wasn't the nicest person, but he was brilliant. It's kind of like Hagrid or whoever, when, when they talk about Lord, Lord Voldemort, they're like, terrible, but great. Terrible, but great. Very kind of curly vibes. He was very intense. He was um, an occultist um, in Britain, and he did a lot of stuff. Amazing work. I mean, I mean if you read his stuff, you could, the guy's brilliant. Um, but yeah, he kind of directed this deck. Lady, Lady Frida Harris painted it. Um, and the main difference between this deck and the deck that we're all used to seeing, which is the Rider Waite Smith Tarot, is that this deck has, well, two major differences. The first major difference would be that this deck is kind of more open about the esoteric origin of the tarot, namely the Hermetical Order of the Golden Dawn. So Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was uh, a bunch of really cool, but you know, rich people with a lot of time in their hands. You know, when you get you when you when you have the time, when you have the money, you get into art and philosophy and like really, really deep things, mysticism. You know, you kind of go even farther into this world and this life. And the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was doing that. They were very syncretic. They would bring together a lot of different occult, mystical, and uh, spiritual philosophies and traditions. Um, they were happening. I think 1888 is when they started. Uh, it was started by like three Freemasons. One one of them was McGregor Mathers and uh, uh, Mr. Westcott and some other people. But they all got together, had a party, and then they just kept doing it. And uh, they wrote a lot of really cool stuff. And they developed this system that really syncretized a lot of really deep things. Uh, things like astrology, uh, Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism, um, alchemy, um, even elements of Tantra, um, Eastern stuff. So yeah, they were working a lot with a lot of very heavy, deep stuff, grimoire stuff that comes from the Renaissance. It has to do with like summoning entities and demons and stuff. Um, but yeah, they were doing a lot of cool stuff and they really changed the, the game of tarot. Now, you can argue that tarot was not inherently occult before them, but maybe it was. You know, we have one thing about the occult you have to get, you'll see if you look into it, is that a lot of it is kind of like projecting histories onto writings and materials that the histories may not quite exist, but the beauty of it is even if the history of certain documents don't exist, like let's say it's not like this grandiose, magical, mystery, mysterious thing that comes from Egypt. The content that the material talks about, like let's say tarot, is still so deep. And the content that tarot talks about is not, when you really kind of look at it, is not so different from something I would say like the I Ching, which happened at the other side of the world, a different divination system. But what's so cool is that it shares these kind of like truths or ideas or philosophies um, without having to have the same origin, which kind of suggests that maybe there is some sort of similar origin, maybe not necessarily in time, but maybe in consciousness. I don't know. We all have a similar brain, you know? We all love to project things from our human species brain onto this stuff and make sense out of it, and we kind of do it very similarly. You know, when you zoom out and really look at us as a species, right? Um, right, we all know up and down and right and left and this hand and that hand. We walk the same. Cool. We make noises with our mouths. We communicate. It's all things that are similar. Cool. So, um, where was I going with that? I told you I get really ranty. Um, oh, so anyway, so the Golden Dawn was doing its thing and they took tarot and made it very like extra. They added Kabbalah, they added astrology and they fused these things together. Whether or not they were fused before Golden Dawn is up, is up to interpretation, but they really kind of brought it to this level of like, oh, tarot is not just, you know, originally tarot was a, a playing card game, um, but they kind of brought it out of this uh, playing card game that came out of the Renaissance and, and uh, Christian Italy and into this place of not, not, divination was a thing before Golden Dawn, but they brought it into like, let's make the tarot a map of the world. Let's make it the tarot an illustration of entities and angelic intelligences and all these really cool things and really brought it to the next level. Um, and one thing about a lot of occultism is in the, the nature of occult is to be secret, right? Etym etymologically occult means like hidden, it means secret. 
um, which makes it so much more delicious, right? I mean, if it wasn't a cult and secret, would we, re would we really be here, like kind of peering into it, right? It plays hard to get with us a little bit. So, um, so these occultists were kind of, they never, they didn't give it to you all. They, they didn't give it to everybody. And um, some people might say that's gatekeeping, but I believe it's because the nature of the material that they were working with was so deep and so far down the wormhole of consciousness that even if they were to give it to everyone, people, A, wouldn't understand, B, it would be dangerous, and a number of other reasons. So there's a general sense of holding back when the cultists kind of teach stuff and reveal stuff. Um, and I mean, that's kind of the tr true in a way with the Eastern mystics too, because they're like ninjas, you know? You ever talk to a Zen master? They just, they like know something that you don't, but they also know that you know, but they kind of wink at you a little bit. It's kind of like, you ever like talk to a drag queen? They just mess with you in the mind. They're so good. They're just, they get you in, in, in the head. And like, yeah, it's a, that's a whole other form of mysticism. Um, but yeah. So, so yeah, so but back to this deck. <laughs> so the Rider Waite Smith deck became the most popular deck today. And it's an, oh my God, it's such an amazing deck. It's so deep and it's so good with reading. There's so many good things about it. Pamela Coleman Smith was brilliant that she painted it. Uh, Arthur Edward Waite was the one who directed it. Um, but the thing with that deck is it's not, it doesn't give you all of the occult and esoteric stuff that Tarot is playing with at least, you know, Golden Dawn and afterwards. Um, and even before Golden Dawn, they were playing with Kabbalah and Tarot and all that stuff. But it kind of, it doesn't necessarily hide things, but it kind of does. Like he didn't give you the whole story, um, even though it's an amazing deck. Now, Arthur Edward Waite generally as a writer is someone who doesn't give it all away. That's kind of his thing. And he, you don't really ever know where he stands, the way he writes, he suggests things, but then he puts down like things and he kind of closes the door on you. Maybe that's the game he's playing. Um, Alistair Crowley on the other hand, I mean, he does that as well, but he directed the creation of the Thoth deck and wrote the book to the Thoth deck uh, towards the end of his life. So at this point, he had been through so much experience, so much, he was like, screw it, I'm gonna give away all the secrets. And he got in a lot of trouble for doing this over throughout his life, you know, releasing these secrets of these esoteric orders like Golden Dawn, and uh, he released the secret of the OTO, the Ordo, Ordo uh, Templi Orientalis, Orientis. Um, but yeah, he loves that. He loves releasing secrets. He loves, God. but that's one of his goals. And that's one of the reasons why I like him is because he really wanted to bring magic into the mainstream. He wanted everyone to be able to experience magic and the occult and all of that. So he released a lot of that material in his deck, in the symbolism, in the book that he wrote for it. Um, but also he released his own philosophy, uh, which is connected to the religion that he created called the Lima. And the Lima was something that <clears throat> came to be when he channeled a being, Iwas, in uh, 1904, which dictated to him something called the Book of the Law. Now, at the time, I don't think channeling and writing channeled books was really like a common thing. Today, in 2022, everyone and their mom is channeling books. And that's totally cool because we're raising in consciousness. You know, everyone's got a channeled book out today. Great. Love it. You see everyone online like, I just got a download. This is the number. This is the vibe. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. But at the time of Aleister Crowley, it was like, like it's a rare thing. Um, so, so he wrote this book of the law and then he kind of left it alone for a bit and had a little Eastern mysticism side quest, came back to magic. And then he was like, oh, right. The Lima is the vibe. That's what I'm gonna focus on. So he, he created his deck mostly in the philosophy of the Golden Dawn uh, Kabbalistic Tarot tradition, plus his uh, philosophy from the Lima. So the, and the, the basic, uh, I'm really summarizing an entire religion here, so please cut me some slack for if there's any filaments out there, but the very basic idea of the Lima is that we're all metaphorically and in some way literally a star and that the best thing to do is your true will and that your true will is like your higher calling and when you do that the universe serves you it's a very individual focus and it destroys the middleman of other forms of religion so there's no like office or person that you have to go through go to for your salvation it's very direct and it just follow your true will that's it of course there's so much more to it but that's kind of the general vibe and in, in the context of what we're doing today i want to share that with you because the deck itself really, you know, does that. It really kind of says, all right, what's your true will? You know, focus on that and let go of all the annoying things that don't 
are not relevant. It, it, it's very, it's very about the, much about the individual, um, <clears throat> which is cool. Um, another influence on this deck that's a little bit different than the, than the traditional deck is uh, Curly was very influenced by um, Enochian magic. Uh, this is a form of magic where you actually become initiated into what, what 30 uh, airs or 30 ethers, um, and you kind of talk to angels and trip out. 30 times <laughs> and it's, it's a it's a very you know it could you know some might say it's a very dangerous form of magic it's very intense um but that really shaped his philosophy his visions from this very intense um mode uh, uh form of magic uh now this form of magic comes out of uh renaissance with uh john d who was the astrologer for queen elizabeth and he, him and this guy edward kelly come, came together and did this whole they worked together for a long time and they were channeling angels and channeled this whole system, this whole angelic language and method to kind of like engage with these intelligences and, and have these experiences. And um, yeah, it's very beautiful. But a lot of his deck is, and his philosophy is based off of that as well. And he's very um, open about a lot of this stuff. Uh, he doesn't explain it easily, but he references a lot of this stuff. And so for anyone out there who wants to really deep dive into this deck, you're obviously going to want to eventually read the Book of Thoth, which is the book that he wrote with it. The Book of Thoth is not the little white book that comes with the tarot deck. Mm -hmm. Like, the Book of Thoth is, like, referencing 50 books that he has written over his life. Like, so many books and references and, and so many forms of magic and, and occult ideas. So it's definitely a wormhole. Um, <clears throat> but just note that if you are reading Book of Thoth, Look at, look at it like more of a curation of notes from different places. Like there's the book, but then there's so many moments where like look at the annotations and you'll, you'll probably be getting like five other books to kind of fully <laughs> comprehend it. Um, but yeah, or to, you know, save you some time, you could just look at my guide. Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> so I just wanted to give you that um, sense of like where this deck is coming from as opposed to the Rider Waite Smith deck, which is the most kind of popular deck, which is also an amazing deck. Um, <clears throat> Arthur Edward Waite was also in the Golden Dawn, so he also had like the keys to the mysteries. Uh, he wasn't as explicit about them. You'll also notice that in the RWS deck, it's a little bit, there's a lot more Christian symbolism uh, because I believe Arthur Edward Waite, and I might be wrong, but I believe he was a Catholic or Christian mystic, which is its own wormhole. It's actually really, really cool. Um, all this stuff is cool, you know. I'm interfaith AF, you know, I like it all. I'm, I'm very greedy with information. But yeah, so he was a Christian mystic, so you'll notice a lot of Christian symbolism. And, and I'll, I'll just leave a little footnote here, side wormhole for later. If you really want to go down the wormhole with the Rider Waite Smith deck, you may notice that the major arcana, there's 22 of them, you might notice that each of those cards may or may not have a connection with the chapters of Revelation. But no one talks about that, because that's one of the, like, cool things but yeah when i found that that i was like 